We're joined today by Ben Salem, perhaps one of the most powerful agents in the U.S. that you may never have heard of, and Ben likes it that way. As a matter of fact, Ben has built a real estate business dependent on his ability to offer his clients ultra-exclusivity and privacy. As a top-ranking luxury real estate agent in Los Angeles County, Ben's high-energy, in-depth knowledge and passion for real estate have allowed him to consistently outrank other real estate experts since 2004. Ben grew up in Los Angeles and has direct access to a diverse clientele. His typical client is a celebrity, international business person, or in a few recent cases, actual royalty. They hire him because they know he will always put their needs first, and he offers something that is unique to the L.A. market, which is complete and total privacy. Ben refers to this exclusive program as his private client services. Ben's following of private clients often ask him to sell their home privately, giving him exclusive access to pocket listings for some of the biggest celebrities in the L.A. area. Over time, he's developed a reputation for protecting the privacy, security, and anonymity of his clients, making him a go-to agent for ultra-high net worth buyers and sellers. Let's welcome Ben to the call as we join our host, Tim Harris. Good Lord. I think Mr. Show Producer Tim Ventura is going to get overtime pay for reading that long-winded intro. Good golly! <laughs> hey, Ben, welcome to, the, welcome to today's podcast. Good morning. Good morning. So, guys, I oftentimes, Julie and I oftentimes on this podcast, will ask a question of all of you to consider. And this is the same question. Just in full disclosure, I've uh, coached Ben on and off for, it seems like, forever. And um, Ben had the same question uh, posed to him ages ago. And frankly, in my opinion, he, made the, he, he chose the correct answer. And here's the question I'm going to ask all of you guys. And, you know, Ben, there's over 100,000 regular listens and the rest of it. So, you know, let's try our best on today's show to really be impactful on these guys. So if you had a choice, listeners, between being famous and being rich, which would you choose? Don't assume that being famous is going to mean that you're rich. And Ben, if he, if he actually will uh, tell us some stories of dealing with his, his famous people and how many of them aren't rich, that might be kind of an interesting anecdote to today's podcast. But, guys, listen, if you have a choice between famous and uh, being famous and being rich, what would you choose? Here's the fascinating thing. Through Ben and a lot of our, my other personal clients, I've gotten indirectly to know some of the most famous people, celebrities, and just all kinds of people in the country. And I am always shocked how many of them absolutely have very little net worth, but they're very, very famous. Because most people, in my opinion, in Ben's opinion, by the way, make the wrong decision and choose to be or choose to be famous opposed to be rich. And in our industry, uh, that is a huge problem because a lot of agents will spend all their money on their personal branding and whatnot in order to basically look a certain way and not actually have anything to show for it. Or as we say here in Texas, tall hat, no cattle. So, Ben, I really appreciate you taking the time out uh, to be on the podcast. I've been trying to get Ben on this podcast for probably two years, and so finally he agreed to do it. So I have a feeling this is going to be one of our best shows ever. So, Mr. Salem, I really appreciate your time today. Yeah, thanks. I'm happy, happy to be here. So, Ben, you are uh, famous for not being famous, working with some of the most famous people in the world. How did you get started on working with these ultra high net worth folks, these celebrities, and literally members of royal families. How did you actually get started on that path? Um, kind of, kind of random, actually. Um, just a, a lot of networking, going to anything from concerts to networking events to um, actually never eating lunch or alone or have or you know, having breakfast alone, always randomly networking and meeting people, but networking at the right areas, basically. Um, so, it's, you know, it led to, to, meeting a, uh, to meeting someone who was a uh, business manager who eventually introduced me to some other people. And then I met a couple uh, actors uh, randomly at a, at a lunch, lunch event who introduced me to some other people, and it just kind of snowballed from there. Um, 
you told me a story a couple of weeks ago, and I know you're not going to want to retell the story using the actual names of the people involved, but you told me a story about going, and if you want to pass on this one or if you want to tell a story, it's up to you. And we'll make it even more general in case some of the people involved in this might be listening. But it's such a killer, incredible story about how effective you are at networking. You guys always hear, listeners, you always hear these high-end agents like Ben talking about the fact that they work centers of influence and past clients, but they never – have you guys, listeners, have you ever noticed when I ask one of these big agents, you know what their best source of business is they always say centers of influence the best clients but they never tell you how to work it they never actually tell you what they do well ben if you don't mind could you share the story about the clippers game that you told me a couple weeks ago i'm trying to remember which one was that <laughs> exactly well do you want me to remind you to get you started go for it Okay, so you were taking a, a person who's in the entertainment industry to a Clippers game, and you were the person paying for the tickets, and then from that you ran into – okay, you can pick it up from there. Oh, yes. <laughs> um, we ran into um, two of his clients, and, and while we ran into two of his clients, we ran into some other um, clients as well, and um, – ends up being that those clients are friends with some of my clients that he was not he was not aware that I'm friends with, which basically uh, ended up being an, an awesome party. But the, the story of it was none of the clients knew that I've ever worked with each other, and I've been working with these clients <laughs> for years. And uh, yeah. the business manager also did, had no idea that I've worked with his, his other friends uh, – um, that are not his clients, but it 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 basically showed that I really keep my my word and protect my clients. Um, it, it ended so it ended up being a, a huge a huge party. We ended up uh, uh, all hanging out together all night. It was it was a lot of fun, you know. But the point of it is that my clients really come first, and everything stays stays with me. So you guys notice how he's being very careful not to basically – and he oftentimes will operate, and we're getting into the meat and potatoes about how his ultra-high net worth program works. But he, as he literally signs disclosures with all of his clients not to do any, dis, uh, to not to do any disclosures. But here's the essence of his story. So um, – he, you know, basically you guys heard him say it, but he put himself in a position where he was essentially with one of his, uh, he said it, business managers. And, and that business manager turned out they were friends with somebody else that was sitting near them. Well, it turns out that basically this whole section where Ben was sitting and the private club above, Ben knew all these people. And so this business manager basically was able to get a bunch of new clients and the business manager introduced Ben to a bunch of new clients. And then from that, Ben, if I, I might be remembering this part incorrectly, but didn't you pick up like two or three solid uh, listing leads just from that one interchange, that one interaction, that one game. Yeah, it was amazing. You never, it's it's crazy because you never know where it's going to come from, right? But it, it worked out. It worked out beautifully. <laughs> So you have, again, worked with a lot of the biggest name brand um, agents in the world, and you're not one of these big, big agents. You're not boastful. You're not, like, you know, driving a big fancy Bentley. You know, none of those things are you. Is that one of the reasons they choose to do business with you is because you're so low-key? I think that's, that's, one of the, that's one of the reasons, but I think another reason is because I, I feel like I figured out some ways to really protect my clients, you know, if, if – I'll have the paparazzi follow us to to a different property that's not the one we're going to get. Um, I've hired detectives to stay ahead and keep up with what Team Z is going to do. You know, they change their strategy on how they find out where people live. So I'm, I'm trying to stay one step ahead of them, and I feel like I've, I've, I've mastered it. And then I also educate my clients and their kids and their family on how to stay away from the media and hide hide. You, basically your identity, how to stay out of out of the light, you know, anything from simple things like not ordering Amazon to your home and not disclosing your address ever to, to, to anyone and setting everything up the right way. Um, so I think it's, it's just, I think that's part of it. And also learning what my client really wants. I mean, my clients ask for really unique things that are really hard to get. Some clients want to find a, a home that has a bunker or a safe room um, or if it doesn't, can we build one there? What kind of soil is it? How far is the bedrock? You know, the really interesting things. Um, and finding these properties are really hard to do, and a lot of these properties are not on the market. Some clients want 
a property that has to have a helipad, and how do you get a permit for that? Um, you know, and, and some of these clients only communicate via text, never on the phone. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a different way of doing business. So you have to learn your client's needs and figure out exactly what they want and how to make it happen really quick. Because a lot of these clients come in for 24 or 48 hours, and you have to be ready. And you've got to find, a, find them exactly what they want, you know. So it's a, lot of, a lot of things go into it, I think, that, that, that really make a big difference. You mentioned something there, and I think it's worth drilling down on. You said oftentimes you'll have uh, people that uh, – you said private detectives, but what the private detectives are doing is they're sweeping for any kind of cameras or audio recording devices in the houses that you're going to show because you had a, you've had situations before where you were working with these high-profile folks, and then you found – you got to the house, and you discovered that – and tell me if I'm going too far off and ahead of my skis here and you don't want me, want me talking about this stuff, but you had discovered that, say, for example, if this was not your listing, that the listing agent had tipped off the, you know, the paparazzi that the house was going to be shown to some big-name person. And in exchange for that tip, that listing agent may have been getting some kind of financial, like 500 bucks or 1000 bucks. And so you actually were sending people ahead of time to see if there were people like camped out with cameras, not to mention the fact that the house had been bugged to monitor so-and-so as they were looking at a specific house. You had situations like that happen in the past. And uh, those are the types of things that when you're working with these high net worth folks, you know, Ben, it's interesting. We're talking about paparazzi and people having images of pictures and stupid things like that. But the primary concerns and one of the, you know, the reason I continuously hear these people choose to work with you is because you respect their privacy, but also you anticipate their security needs, which is really at the essence of their need for privacy. So when you're working with some big name celebrity, like what are the types of special you mentioned bunkers and you mentioned safe houses and you mentioned things of that nature but what are the other types of things that they look for in the properties that maybe a normal person wouldn't take into consideration well so you have you have you have, certain, you, have you have a couple different kinds of buyers right so for example the last buyer i had is an is a artist that tours a lot so he needed a home that's centrally located we would call that the hub and that home also will have to have a recording studio so he wanted something with um, with a killer ocean view, with a big lot, and uh, completely private. So what I had to do on this one was try to also purchase and assemble other lots around him to see if the neighbors were interested in selling, because he wanted he wanted a really big lot. But finding a big lot with a with a really nice view in Malibu and private is is tough to do. So uh, you know um, you have that kind of buyer. Then you have another a different kind of buyer that says, hey, Ben, I need a home in the Hollywood Hills um, because we like to party a lot. You know, you, have to, you, you go from ex one extreme to another extreme. So how do you find a home that is also private and you could you could host some parties and make some noise? So so the, like I said, the first thing is you've got to find out the client's needs and you've got to make it happen. And behind, behind the scene is, you know, talking to the neighbors, figuring out if they're interested in selling and previewing all the properties for them. And just really nailing it the first or the second time is, is the key because these people are so busy and their time is so valuable. To get them out takes a lot. So I really have to nail it on the, on the first time and, and uh, put some camo gear on them, <laughs> a hat and glasses, <laughs> and really protect them. Uh, no joke, you know, because sometimes it's hard to get the agent out of there and have a private showing all alone with no one in there at all. So if that's the case, well, then, it's a but it's a security thing too, right? It's not just TMZ looking in property records. And it, it, if, you know, you found out, you discovered something interesting recently. How you know you discovered that TMZ basically was uh, earmarking the private trusts that these high-end folks were transacting in. And uh, every time that you know, I don't think I'm you know talking at a church here, but every time that trust came up in property records as an indication that, that celebrity had just done a real estate transaction, sure enough, that would be in TMZ or on one of these other real estate gossip sites. And that's one of the things that you figured out a long time ago, and you help your clients to avoid that through setting up different trust structures through your small network of um, you know, really private security experts, but also trust attorneys and, and just other, other kinds of ways of closing transactions, which is probably too tactical to get into on today's show. But that's another reason that I know that people choose to work with you. I mean, you've actually had people tell you that before. I chose to work with you because you could keep my transaction totally private. Um, but on the security front, 
with people actually worrying about, you know, again, this is not something that normal people like, you know, me and you have to necessarily worry about, but these guys got to worry about death threats. They have to worry about kidnappings. They have to worry about all kinds of crazy things happening. And privacy is the exact opposite of what you get when you're working with most major LA-based agents because the agents want to do nothing but brag about that they're working with so-and-so and so-and-so. And 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 Ben's the exact opposite. Ben is being so private and low-key and quiet and – I don't know what you want to call it, almost James Bond-like. Does that work against you sometimes in generating new business because you're not just a big braggart? I, I think it, it took a really long time for, for people to appreciate that and, to, get, and to, to build my business. I think with, with anything you do, it just takes a really long time. But it's really worked out. And, and you know, my biggest fear is that if someone finds out where the client lives, it's it's over. My client has to get rid of that home. They have to move right away, and all that was for nothing. So I mean, that's that stuff that you know I'm I'm constantly uh, brainstorming in my own head. What can I do different? What can I do different? How do I get them to this property? How do I show this property without anyone knowing about it? And even with with my emails, we create alias names in case I need one of my assistants to help me. Even my assistant won't know who the client is. It's a, a different alias name we create. So, I mean, I really protect them every angle. Even if I need to get a photographer there to, to the home to help me with something, it, we come up with a, we find a job of, of this person, a name. We create a fake job for them. It's a whole story. I mean, even when, when I represent a buyer, the seller will never know what my client does for a living, who they are, or anything. Uh, so you're talking about using email services like Confide and other things like that that basically make it so you can totally hide your identity when sending SMSs. That's the essence of it, right? I mean, that's kind of what you just indicated. Maybe yeah. it, maybe the listeners exactly. want to pick up on something like that. Okay. So let, if you don't mind a little bit, can we talk about business managers? Can we talk about the, 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 the management structure that a lot of these ultra-high net worth people have around them? that they need to understand? Because it's not like, you know, hey, I, you called about my list to get 123 Elm Street. Let's go see it. There is a whole level of bureaucracy that you personally have to go through or had to go through, don't know, need to so much anymore because people send you business, but in order to even get access to uh, the clients. Can you talk a little bit about the typical management structures that these high net worth people have around them? Yeah, so basically, you know, they, they you're dealing with um, – Entertainment attorneys and real estate attorneys, and, um, and and estates and trust attorneys, and you're dealing with their CPAs and their business managers. There's so many people assisting in the transaction. So, you, and you, you know, you have to you have to basically uh, make sure everyone's synchronized, everyone's on the same page. There's so there's so many there's so many spokes on this wheel, right? And everyone has different opinions. And you have to respect everyone's opinion, but you also, you have to also negotiate the the, per, the perfect strategy to win to win this deal. So it, it becomes fun, and you become friends with everyone eventually because you everyone has their own strategy of negotiating, and it's fun when you get some high-powered attorneys and some high-powered business managers to all put their heads together, all of us together, and strategize how are we going to win, how are we going to get the client the highest net. Or how are we going to make sure this client gets this property? We're going up against 14 other offers on this, and that's where it becomes really fun, right? Um, that's where the that's where the rush is, and that's what's really fun about these deals. They're really complex. It's not it's not that easy. There's so much. There's so many spokes in this wheel. Well, you so you mentioned something there that's worth mentioning because a lot of guys don't get that. Is the business managers oftentimes will literally be doing the, you know, a bulk of the work and on behalf of this other, whoever the person is, be it an artist or a business person or a politician or a member of the Saudi royal family. I know you've worked with one of the, you know, all that. So you're oftentimes going to be dealing with an intermediary, and that intermediary is going to be the one you negotiate with until you gain the trust of the intermediary and the client, and then oftentimes you'll deal directly with the client. But getting really to work the, with these business managers to get them to trust you, that took literally years. That's not just a simple cold call and say, hey, let's go catch some coffee. So if someone's in you know, a different part of the world, because we have folks listening in 11 different countries, and they wanted to follow a similar path, any suggestions that you have for them as far as how to start networking with business managers or other gatekeepers of the same ilk? I wouldn't say the business managers are – 
the the only gatekeepers. It's a lot of I think CPAs, entertainment attorneys, trust attorneys, uh, family law attorneys. There's so many. There's so many different uh, if, if people that you want to build relationships and, and, and gain trust. But I mean, really, all it takes is for them to just give you an opportunity. You know, just ask. Hey, what do I have to do to earn your business? Can I just have one shot? Give me one shot. I promise I won't disappoint you. You know, if that's all you need. If, you, if someone gives you an opportunity and you kill it and you do a great job, they're going to continue giving you business. But you have to be 10 steps ahead of them. You're constantly playing chess in your head. You're going to sleep at night and your brain keeps going, keeps going because they're already a couple steps ahead of you. These people are so sophisticated and have done so many um, of these uh, l- l- uh, big transactions. These transactions are huge, so they're a lot more sophisticated. So the, these these people are sophisticated too. So you just have to be a couple steps ahead and constantly keep thinking, what's going to happen next? What's going to happen next? You've got to be ahead of the game. And I think once you kill it for them, they're going to continue working with you. That's really what it comes down to, right? You've had clients that have landed on your roster um, that had basically, you know, everyone would have heard of before that wanted to sell – properties and they absolutely positively did not want anyone to know that they were selling the property and you know just like normal sellers listeners a lot of these high-end people they don't want people to know that they're selling because maybe they have a financial issue or maybe they have a lifestyle issue maybe they have who knows what issue is going on with them how do you and i know you're like this is probably i in the country i I honestly don't know of anyone that handles uh, pocket listings better than you do, especially with these high-end pocket listings that you have. So how do you go about selecting who you're going to share the information with about the pocket listing amongst the other brokers uh, that also work in the high end? How did you go about refining your list of the folks that you choose to expose some of these really you know, very high-end off-market listings to? So a, cu- a couple ways. There's – there's uh, obviously the, the, there's other agents that do great work and are very respected, and you know over the years I've built great relationships with them, and they'll let me know about you know their listings, and I'll let them know about my listing, and um, so we kind of share. And, and the goal is you want to have these relationships with, you know, not not just your your area, but you know in, in other states, right? That's that's the key. Um, mm-hmm. So build relationships with a lot of other agents. And in the beginning, what I did was I created a small mastermind group of, of uh, top-producing agents and brokers in different states and, and build really great relationships. So we'll have a call once a week and mastermind together. And then doing that, you build the relationship. Uh, so that's one way. Well, you, Another and, way is – you go ahead. Yeah, sorry. No, no, I was going to say, you talk with people in England, too. I know you have, uh, in your mastermind, you've had people from Australia. You have people, yeah. you, you know, all the, you know, Zurich and all the places that are the financial centers were all basically, you know, rich people. You know, that's it. You basically have connected with who you perceive to be. A, they can't be jerks, and B, they have to be some of the – they have to have credibility. They actually have to have a track record of working with similar people, and those are the people that you have invited to be part of the mastermind. And most of these folks, they may have heard of you, but what they probably – well, they definitely have heard of the folks you've done business with or the houses that you've participated in, and uh, so they want to be part of this. And, and that's the way you've built your professional networking group, and that's the same way that we have all of our top agents in Manhattan. And, you know, I had recently – if Rob's listening, he, I connected him with uh, some of our top agents in Manhattan. He's in Greenwich, Connecticut, so he's establishing some great sources. I know you know Rob, too, in Greenwich. You know, you guys have talked before. So that's the way yeah. that you guys get wired into these ultra-high net worth. And, and really, we're talking about people worth hundreds of millions of dollars and oftentimes billions of dollars. Ben does transact in normal price range stuff because a lot of the friends he grew up with um, around L.A., he's, you know, obviously a lot of those folks are not at that level, but he does obvious deals with them as well. So I'm sorry, you were about to say something, or did you forget already? <laughs> uh, no, it's okay, it's okay. But yeah, that, 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 I think that's the, that's the key. It's all about networking, right? And, uh, and, 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 and another thing that works really great, actually, is if you have a great pocket that fits, let's say you have a pocket with a recording studio, with an amazing recording studio, who are you going to market that to, Right? So you want to figure out uh, what entertainment attorneys represent who and what countries and what states. 
and send them a really nice basket with a video brochure. Um, and even with, with flights, pay for the flights to have them come down and take a look at your property and send them the property without the address but with all the details and try to pick up, you know, uh, the, the buyer for that, for that asset. So it's a combination of a bunch of things, but they all, they all work, and you've got to do all of them. I would love – so Ben made me sign a non-disclosure a long time ago so that, you know, he and I – but he still won't tell me the names of all of his clients, but occasionally, you know, one slips. And I would love for you guys to know some of the names that he deals with, uh, the people he deals with. Some of the stories he tells me, you know, they can't share on this podcast are absolutely priceless. Um, you know, it's hard to really explain to you guys the fact that all of you can branch into – maybe there's not – where Julie and I sold real estate in Columbus, Ohio, there was – you know, maybe two or three billionaires. In Ben's world, there's like a billionaire around every corner. So this market wasn't available to us at this level when we sold real estate. But some of you are very close to a market that is similar to this. And a lot of you have maybe in your heads that you can't get into this market because you didn't grow up in the right community or you didn't go to the right schools or you don't have the right level of education or you don't any of those types of things. So Ben, um, you are a very humble guy, and again, I think that's one of the reasons that people are attracted to you, because your ego is not in competition with your client's ego. Your client is always number one, which is what you were talking about earlier. You're not trying to make yourself the star. They're the star, unlike a lot of these other celebrity agents, who are they're, they're literally trying to compete, or at least the perception is from the potential customer that this person's feeling competitive for you know the whole fame ego thing. Ben never has that vibe about him. So Ben, if you don't mind, can can you tell folks uh, – and we asked about how you got into the business, and it you know, made sense. Can you tell folks a little bit about like, your own personal background, you know, where you grew up, and you know, some of the people you grew up with? But really, I want folks to know that you're a normal guy who just basically has worked hard and been strategic about the decisions he's made. Sure. Yeah, so I, I grew up in, in uh, the Calabasas area, and, and um, right out of um, – High school, I knew I wanted to get into real estate, so I jumped into real estate. And I think my first year, I was really struggling. I didn't know what I was doing. And um, the second year, I decided, what if I start just door knocking? So I found an area, and I said, I'm going to door knock 800 homes per month, and I'm going to offer to bring uh, an in-and-out uh, burger truck and feed the whole neighborhood. So I started passing around my like, postcards saying, hey come to this In-N-Out event, and uh, I'm hosting a, a free lunch for everyone. And I, I brought a band to come and play. And I think in, the, in that first six months, I sold 14 homes in that area. And then I continuously did that every year, every year, and started, like, doubling and doubling my income. And then, um, then I got into uh, developing some real estate, which was really fun, and flipping properties. And then when the, when the recession came, I had no idea how to make money. And everything was falling out of escrow, and we're, I think all of us in the business were struggling. And uh, I thought, well, what do I do? How do I make money now? Um, so I thought, I think it would be a good idea to start networking with hedge funds um, because the hedge funds have properties to sell and the banks have properties to sell. So I started door knocking again, which is what I knew how to do. So I started door knocking, going, going from – state to state and door knocking the wrong people over and over again. Well, and, but, but, but uh, be specific, be specific. Cause you did this with Mark who we don't need to mention yeah. Mark's last name, but you did this with Mark and you guys would get on planes and you guys would literally like basically lunch bomb them. You'd show up with lunch at their office or whatever and say, right. Hey, we're here to meet you, Mr. Executive. And you kicked in doors and you did this. You and Mark were doing this in 07 uh, before everyone else even knew what uh, any distressed property, what, what really what it meant, especially in L.A. People had a belief that that type of market wasn't ever going to come to L.A. I remember being in line at the post office at Laguna Beach, and two old t- old-time Laguna Beach uh, men, and these were older guys, were literally almost getting in a fight because one of them said uh, Laguna Beach real estate was going to lose value, and the other just thought that the guy was like, you know, saying something that was basically against his religion kind of thing. You know, that kind of yeah. – it was hilarious. Not it. So that's what, you're, that's what you're describing when you're door, door knocking. You took your, you took your, sa- your re- residential – skills and you applied it on a you know, you scaled it and started going after big corporations that's what you're describing correct yeah and it was it was fun there was no uber back then so we were <laughs> we were renting cars or, or driving taxi cabs and 
and then, you know, we were str- struggling, sleeping in, like, Motel 6, and it was funny, you know, oftentimes we'd door knock and show up at the at what we thought was the uh, the person that could help us out, and then we're like, oh, you're, you're in the wrong state. You're not supposed to be in Colorado. <laughs> so we grab a grab a flight, go to another state, and then you know, bring lunches and bring breakfast, and and you know, just try to network, try to meet the right people. So we did that for about seven months, uh, and uh, and it, it it didn't really work. Um, every time we thought, could you can you do you mind telling the yacht story? Do you mind telling the yacht story? Sure. And then, uh, okay. and then I found okay. out that okay. there's going to be yeah. there's going to be a um, private yacht in Florida, and uh, there's going to be a casino night there, and and there's going to be some hedge funds there, and some big executives there, and that's where basically some of the rainmakers are going to be, the big executives, the people that I've been trying to find. So, so uh, basically, I go, we fly to Florida, get to Florida, and then I'm so excited, have my suit on, I don't even have time to check my bag in, um, leave my bag at the, by, by the yacht because the yacht's about to take off. And uh, I try to get onto the yacht, and obviously they say, no, no real estate brokers, no real estate agents, sorry. So, so now I, Mark and I are kind of bummed. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? And we flew all the way out here. And by the way, we're, we're broke. We, we, we don't have money. It's been that we're like on month eight now with no income, <laughs> And um, and so I look at Mark and I'm thinking, let's just sneak on. Mark goes, perfect. Let's sneak on through the front. So we go, we sneak on, we instantly get caught. And I tell Mark, I told you we should have snuck in from the back. We should have snuck in from the back. Go my way. We're going to sneak into the back. Once we sneak in, I'm going to run to the bathroom. You're going to run to the other bathroom. We're going to split up. Once the boat takes off, then we can come out. We can start networking. And then, of course, we get busted again. And... Uh, I remember this guy, he grabbed me by the back of the neck, and he said, if you, come, if you try to sneak on one more time, it's not going to be good for you. So, so now, um, now we're super depressed, you know, because we're, we're really we're running out of funds. This is, like, this is starting to really hurt, and we're on the, on, the, on the border of just, like, giving up. And I remember my mom saying, how much longer are you going to do this? This is scary. You're going to use all your funds. And I remember my wife saying, well, what, when are you going to call it quits? So that's going through my head at the same time. So, so then I start thinking about it, and I'm thinking, well, what can I do? How do I, just, I just want someone to give me the opportunity. Just one shot. I would do such a killer job for you. I just need one opportunity. Someone would just trust me. Give me one shot. I'm hungry. I need, it. I need to make this happen, you know? So, so I decide to um, get five limos to line up in front of the yacht. And I found that the yacht's going to be coming back at 10 o'clock at night. So we line up, line up five limos, and everyone that's coming out of the yacht I'm basically saying to them, you guys are coming to the after party, right? There's a really nice dinner after party on the beach. And they're saying, well, what are you talking about? So well, everyone knows about the after party. So <laughs> we started recruiting everyone from that boat onto the limos. And <laughs> we ended up hanging out with a bunch of great people, making great friends. And some people gave me some opportunities, which changed my life. And I'm still friends with them and still do a lot of business with them. And it's, Ended up being like the best thing that ever happened. Well, just to put, in case you guys missed it, this is back. So this is 11, 12 years ago. This is back when he was trying to basically get into uh, REOs and get these bank relationships. And the people on the yacht, he did. If I, I think I was talking over him, and it wasn't clear. But the people on the yacht were the executives from. HUD, from Fannie Mae, from Bank of America, from all the big names you'd want to basically be buddies with. And, uh, yeah, so this was a non-agent uh, private yacht party. These types of things, guys, back in the, re- uh, in the recession, in the distressed end of the industry, it was such a big deal. Uh, so many of these types of things going on, all these sort of, you know, people that have always been working in the back offices of these banks, you know, dealing with distressed real estate, especially during the real estate boom that led up to the real estate crash. You know, these guys that did the distress were just the nerds that nobody wanted to talk to, right? Now, because of the crash, and these guys are the rock stars, and they're the ones that everyone wants to invite to their parties, and they're the ones that everyone are gravitating towards. It got, not this incident, but there have been incidences 
that were like reported on by the New York Times about all these types of executives that had just been busted for such crazy lavish spending, you know, in El- in Vegas and places like that. So, and the moral of the story was is that Ben had an opportunity to meet with all, with all these guys early, in the early days. And, uh, yeah, this private yacht, they weren't going to let him on. Matter of fact, not let him on, but they were intentionally trying to throw him off. He, he and Mark used the last sense they have. I think, Mark, or I think Ben, the last time you told me, you said you didn't even return a ticket to get back to uh, L.A., and so you were using literally your last sense to get this, you know, rent these limos. And then from that, you just lock in a whole bunch of – you and Mark lock in just all these – wonderful high-end REO relationships just because you didn't give up, just because you had the ambition to chase it. That's, I think, a really motivational story. It's humorous, you know, that it actually really happened. And you're skipping, you're skipping some details, too, which I can understand why you're skipping them, but still it's funny, you know. But from that, you became an age this, you decided to remodel yourself, and almost rebrand yourself into this, you know, ultra high net worth agent who specializes in dealing with you know, people have sincere security needs. So why, I mean, I realized that the distressed real estate market, uh, you know, waned and you had to pivot. Was, how long, was it difficult to pivot from being that type of agent to the agent you are now? Like, what was the process to make that happen? It was so hard because when you're selling, I was selling about 300 uh, properties a year with a big staff and there was really no emotions. You, it's just another, another asset, another asset. You know, so going from that to right now, I, I, I really only take on about 10, 10 clients at any given time. After that, it's almost impossible because they demand so much. And, you know, if, if, if uh, an attorney says, hey, we need to get on a conference call and it's New Year's and it's, you know, New Year's Eve at 11 o'clock at night, you got to take that call. Like, you, you, you can't say no. And things happen all the time. Um, it's, the demand is pretty gnarly. Uh, so pivoting to that was, was totally different because the customer service level is night and day, right? Um, so, you know, and, and, and with this, you, you can't really have a big team helping you. You really have to take it on on your own and, and give that best service possible. So it was totally totally different game now. Well, you mentioned something there, and it's really worth mentioning. You can't have a big team because the the high-end celebrities and every high-end agent we ever have on the show, they always say the same thing. They don't want to, you to have a big staff because they don't want to have to vet uh, all your staff members. They want to deal with the person who they're going to be dealing with, not the person's administrative assistant. Every, you know, Jade Mills, every single person who's you know, really a true high-end agent, they always say the exact same thing. So that does put the, uh, the onus on you. So you've sold, you know, quote, unquote, normal price houses, you know, and you've sold these really expensive, you know, houses where you get like three, four hundred thousand dollar commission checks. If you know, you, you are obviously in the upper, you know, really ultra high net worth into the market now. Would you uh, ever want to go back and work more towards the lower impact, sort of easier transact, less security needs type business? Or is this where you're going to stay in terms of the focus of your career? This is fun. I love I love what I do. This is fun and it and it keeps my mind going like nonstop. I'm I, like I said, even going to, to bed at night, my mind's always going and I love it. It's it's just so fun and and it's it's a cha- it's a different challenge. It's fun. It's so fun to try to figure out how can I protect my client that no one will ever 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 know where they live or what they purchase and just being a couple steps ahead is just so much fun. It's just a different, it's a different once you game. get past I, I love I love this. Once once you get past the celebrity, you know, famous veneer, um what would be a what what's what surpri- what would surprise most folks about these really really successful famous people you deal with? Uh the really successful people actually have zero ego, which is really just so nice to see. Like zero ego. They're just the nicest people and just, 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 really, really pleasant. The exact opposite of what you, what you would imagine. They don't want the attention. They don't want to be in the media. They're very private, and they, and they're just just like us. There's no difference, really. That's what I think is really surprising. Is most of these really famous people were just normal people that have become successful. Not very many of them, except you know you deal with some royal families and whatnot. 
from the Middle East and whatnot, and those people are generational wealth. But most of these folks have made it on their on their own. They they are the first generation, or they're the first person in their family to be a multi multi millionaire. They did it on their own, and they, at their core, are still just these normal, hardworking people. And I think that's what resonates with them. Another one of the reasons they choose you is because you have that insatiable desire to do better and to improve, and so do they. And that energy, if you don't you – know, here, I'm talking you know, to an L.A. agent, so you'll appreciate me using these hippie words. So that energy probably attracts each other, and that's probably another one of these sort of unspoken reasons why they seek you out, because they sense a, a connection, a commonality with you that maybe they don't often come across uh, in, in, in normal people that aren't so driven. So I think that's another reason. It's one of those unquantifiable things. Guys, I'm doing my best to try to pull from Ben <laughs> information that he doesn't really want shared so that you can learn from it. But what I'm hoping you are all listening to and learning is that Ben's a normal, humble guy, like I said at the top of the show, and you can do what he did, um, and you can do it at any level that you want to. It doesn't necessarily have to be dealing with you know, Jay-Z and doesn't have to be dealing with uh, I don't even want to name drop. You don't have to do that. You can work with just the neighborhood upper end seller who's a dentist or a doctor. Don't be so fearful because of the price because at the essence of it, you're going to discover that they are going to appreciate your drive. They're going to appreciate your ambition. They're going to appreciate the fact that you are a small business owner like many of them started out being. So, Ben, here's something else that will surprise people. The pre-listing pack that you use is based on the same pre-listing pack that we sell at, uh, you know, was part of Premier Coaching. The listing presentation is based on the same listing presentation. The process has worked on the same process. Now, you've edited the pre-LP because you've made it, you know, fancier depending on which house you're going to. You might put it in like a leather binder or you have a really cool like, you know, steel. So presentation, how important is that when you're dealing with folks in this price range? You recently had a very famous person that chose to do business with you because you spoiled him with some sort of gift basket. Can you talk about that? Yeah. So, again, you want to learn what your clients are into, right? So, you know, it's really, really important to, to find out what they're into. And, and if, you know, if they're um, – if they're into a, a certain kind of wine that's really hard to get, how do you get that wine? How, you know, how do you, how do you, the, this wine has a uh, you know, five-year waiting list to get it. Uh, how are you going to find this wine and bring it over with your, with your listing presentation? That would just blow them away, right? To show that you're, you're personal, you know, that you're not just another agent, that all you care about is, is, is you know, just another deal. So you want to build relationships with these people, and you want to build relationships with them Forever, like today, I'm going to lunch with, with, uh, with a client that that I built an amazing relationship with, um, who, who's a who's a pretty big entertainment person, and, you know, it's not after the deal is closed, they stay my friends forever, right? And that that's that's the key. So in the, in in the listing presentation, I try to make it more personal and figure and attach it to something that they're also into. Does that make sense? It does. Well, you spoil them. I mean, you, you've, you've told me how you will go and do research on somebody, and you'll find out what they like. Maybe you read an old article that, where they were interviewed. Maybe an old People magazine where they were on the cover of it. You know, maybe something that you learned from one of their support staff, and you will go and basically seek out ways to surprise them and spoil them. That's one of the, I mean, every year, Ben, I always get a bitch and a uh, really nice uh, pen from you. I'm up on pen, you know? <laughs> so Ben is Ben has learned the art of high-end gift giving, and that's what people remember him for. And you, would, all of you would list, you're listening. You're probably thinking, well, doesn't everybody send a basket of you know Mickey Mouse? That's not what he's sending. He's sending something that if you opened it, you're looking at it thinking, oh my God, how'd Ben know I like that, or how do you know I like that? Because he did his homework. And oftentimes, guys, that and just having an organized approach and a, and a reputation of being professional and private, like what he has, you know, James Bond of real estate is kind of how I always think of Ben. Uh, that's going to get you the business. And you're going to have people, you know, he's told me stories where he'll get a call from somebody who wants to look at some, you know, $10 million house. And then all of a sudden he shows up and then in a, you know, blacked out Range Rover followed by a suburban full of security people, you know, there'll be like this really, really famous person who's actually the one wanting to see the house. They just want to give the real name. I mean, this is Ben's world. He deals with this stuff all the time. 
So listen, guys, I hope you are getting motivation from listening to the fact that here you have somebody who is many times in his career, he's pivoted. You know, he started out doing one thing. He, you know, the market crashed. He gravitated. You know, he's doing normal stuff in L.A. He gravitated towards the distress. That market started to, you know, diminish. Then he decided he wanted to just, you know, really go as big as he could, and he has. So he has recreated himself in just a very short period of time three different times. And some of you guys get stuck in these worlds where you don't believe you can actually change your predicament. You can't change your predicament health-wise, financially. You can't change your predicament, you know, on the, the price range of the houses. It's, guys, it's all in your head. Ben is living proof of the fact that you can be as successful as you choose to be. And, and guess what, guys? Ben is Rich, he has gone from somebody who's basically been, you know, you heard him tell us stories. He had no more room left on his credit cards. That was less than 15 years ago, and now the guy is routinely making hundreds of thousands of dollars per closing. You can do the same thing, you know, scaled to your market. Now, that market wasn't available to me in Columbus, but it is available to a lot of you in other parts of the country, let alone a lot of other parts of the world. So, Ben, anything else? Like, I want these guys to get your contact information, but you have to decide whether you want to give your cell phone number because, remember, this is listened to by over 100,000 people and they're going to call you. But if you guys, you know, you'll have to decide, Ben. Do you want to give out your contact information? Sure. Feel free to uh, give out my email address to anyone. Sure. Well, how about now? Because a lot of people just get the podcast. They're listening on iTunes or Stitcher or whatever else. So tell them how to get in contact with you if they have a referral. Sure. Yeah, my email is ben at bensalemproperties.com. Negative ghostwriter on the phone number, or you want to give that to? Uh, uh, you know, that, the email is actually the, the best way. Okay, there you go. Okay, guys, Perfect. there you go. Um, I, I strive to produce for you, provide for you, um, living, breathing evidence that you can make it as big as you want to in real estate. That's the blessing of being in this industry is that you can decide to be somebody like Ben. You don't have to be some big ego Bentley driving you know, Yahoo who's just trying to basically have everyone look at you even though you know you don't have two nickels to rub together. Ben's a very low-key, James Bond type guy. He has proven that you can be successful regardless of whatever your personality style is, regardless of whatever you, know, you might perceive you have to be and act like in order to be successful. But Mr. Ben Salem, I really appreciate you being my co-host today. You are a real estate uh, superstar, and you always will be. So listeners, if you need me for anything, Tim at TimAndJulieHarris.com or Julie at TimAndJulieHarris.com. Ben, I really appreciate it. Have a fantastic day, everyone.